I'll be uh, reading this morning from Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall no have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water underneath the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the, no the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and sea and all that is, all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the, seventh, the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your, neighbor, covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. Now when all the people saw the thunder, and the flashes of lightning, and the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled, and they stood far off. You can keep your Bibles open to Exodus 20 if you'd like, or you can go ahead and uh, be turning to Luke 14. Luke 14 is where we'll be today. Man, it's good to see this, uh, this crowd today and um, to see all the kids get up and go to class. I just love that. I share that with you. I, I, I pray a lot. I, I, I really do like seeing that. Uh, thank you, John Austin, for that reading. I have uh, grown in my walk with God and in my worship to God to be more and more appreciative of attention to the Word, attention to the Word. Um, I, I like us giving attention to the word and I know sometimes that can be a, a the way we do it can be a tradition that we neglect or don't see the value in but I'm thankful I'm reminded John Austin for for thousands of years thousands of years uh, men have stood or sat in front of assemblies and read what you just read and that's really cool to consider believers in our God uh, our God and so so thankful for that reading um, Perhaps a little bit uh, caught you off guard, maybe. Uh, the Ten Commandments. Uh, Stephen, really, we're in Luke. We're journeying through Luke, and that's right. Uh, we're journeying with Jesus to Jerusalem. That's how I, I designate this portion of Luke that we're in. We're journeying with Jesus to Jerusalem, where he will be uh, crucified and where he will resurrect. Why well, begin with the reading of the Ten Commandments? Well, the Ten Commandments are remarkable, for one. Uh, that's, that's, what I, that's what I want to express to you, and they are. Uh, I consider them a concise listing of what our complex God commands of his people. And that's pretty cool. Anytime you, you have a very complex God who has given us this consolidated listing of what he expects and commands, uh, we can appreciate that. And Jesus upheld and valued um, the Ten Commandments, and he insisted on their connection to eternal life. If we're going to be followers of people, we need to have a relationship with the law. We need to have a relationship with the Ten Commandments. Um, and man, I'm thankful for Jesus. I, uh, again, am so thankful and moved to, to express my desire to move us closer and closer to Jesus. Amen? I thank you. Amen. You know, I, I, uh, I kind of think that those who really had relationship and had love for Jesus when he walked on earth. They missed him so badly. 
and they wanted him to return so badly. And, and, and when memories and thoughts of Jesus would come up, uh, I, I really believe they were still moved by their teacher, by their friend, Jesus. I want us to be moved by Jesus, okay? And so Jesus uh, thought well of these commandments. He, he, he spoke of them often. And so even though we're New Testament Christians, or New Covenant Christians, let me say that, even though we're New Covenant Christians, those saved by grace through faith, and with the law of God written on our hearts by his spirit, all of that is biblical language, the old law and its commandments are still holy and righteous and good. Again, biblical language. Paul said the old law is holy, it's righteous, it's good. It's not good for us to just simply ignore. Jesus strengthened, if you will, the old law. Okay? He, he put the heart back in it. He lived it. Uh, the text will say that he, he fulfilled it. I like to think of Jesus having furthered the old law, okay? And, 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 and we see this in his teachings. Yes, there are things that are no longer applicable to us. Jesus came as the, the atonement, the sacrifice for sin. And so there's things that are no longer apl- uh, applicable, but it's good for us to understand that the, that the law is important. Its commandments are important, strengthened by Jesus. Remember what Jesus would do. This may be new to some of you. This is really cool to consider. Um, a few weeks ago, I, I, I challenged myself. Remember, I always challenge me, and then I shared that challenge with you. If I'm going to be a follower of Jesus, then I need to know Jesus' teachings. Amen? I need, I need to know them. Um, that's good for us. Well, in Matthew chapter 6, 7, and 8, we find the Sermon on the Mount. We find a similar version of it in Luke chapter 6. Do you remember what Jesus is doing back in Matthew chapter 6? He says things like, you've heard that it is said, or you've heard that the ancients were told, you shall not commit murder. What's he quoting there? The ten, right? He's quoting from the ten. But what did Jesus do? He, he put heart in that law. He strengthened it. He furthered it. He said, but I say to you, everyone who is angry with his brother is guilty, right? He would go on to do this several times. You've heard that it is said, you shall not commit adultery, Okay, and so we can do everything but commit adultery, right? This is, this is what the legalistic mindset thinks. Jesus said, said, no, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery in his heart. You see this? He would go on to say, you've heard it said, the ancients were told, you shall not make false vows, indicating you, you don't need to speak lies, right? You don't need to bear false witness. Jesus would say, I say to you, let your yes be yes. And let your no be no. I've taught that here before. I think what Jesus is teaching is is live truth. Therefore, render useless the need to reinforce your words. Let me say that one more time. This is really good. Okay, Live truth. And then you, you, you make useless the need to swear or to even promise. Right? We live truth. I like the... Um, uh, try to teach that to my daughters often, and they probably don't get it, and I hope they will one day. Um, I'll say something. They say, Daddy, you promise? Well, sadly, they probably ask me if I promise because I've probably not kept some of my promises, you know? I want to be a dad, a friend who lives truth. I have no need to reinforce my words with promise or swearing, right? This is what Jesus is teaching, okay? This is hard, amen? It's hard. That's why we're trying to do this together, you know what? Right? Ah, Jesus. He is good. He is good. Jesus did not, again, destroy the Ten Commandments. He fulfilled them, and he lived out the very heart of them so that we can too. He lived the heart of them so that we can too. In practice and through grace, we're able to live out the heart of the entire law. Amen. What I'm getting at, though, he even upheld Sabbath. Okay? I would suggest that Sabbath is the one for me that I've most often either ignored or considered nullified, over, no longer appropriate for me to consider, okay? That, that's, that's me. That may be you too. I don't know. Jesus, Jesus didn't really talk that way, though, and he didn't live that way, and the entirety of God's story shouldn't leave us feeling that way. Jesus came and he said, I am the Lord of the Sabbath, right? Right? Uh, Jesus came and exampled what it is to rest in God forever. 
I made this connection a few weeks ago, and, and for some of you, I understand if it might have went whoop, because it's kind of a really important and new one for me. I've been thinking about this a lot, but uh, I invited you to consider with me how, how in, 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 in faith to Jesus, by faith in Jesus, united in Jesus, we enter into a believer's rest, a Sabbath, if you will, that is now and is also forever, Okay. I, I won't do this again. You can go back and look at it online if you'd like. But I asked you to consider how both Sabbath and God's kingdom are worthy to be compared. Jesus inaugurated his kingdom at resurrection. We get to be kingdom people. Amen. Peace that passes understanding now. Amen. It's hard. One day it won't be. When our king returns and when God is revealed in all of his glory, it will not be hard to praise him forever. Amen. We have a degree of Sabbath now, of rest now through Jesus. But we have a fully, a, a, a perfect and forever, for, forever Sabbath that is coming, a kingdom that is coming. Remember I used the words, uh, he inaugurated his kingdom at resurrection, but he will consummate his kingdom at return. Amen. Oh, that's good, Okay. So, so consider Sabbath in that way with me, if you will. This is why we don't, we don't honor a specific Sabbath the way the Jews did. Instead, as Christians, we honor a forever Sabbath. We live a Sabbath. Now, now if you want to take a day and use a day and, and purpose it for mindfulness to God, I have no problem with that. Some may. But look, as a new covenant believer, we live Sabbath through Jesus Christ. Okay? Okay. The Jews gave such high regard to their Sabbath, and they even do today. It's really neat to consider. You may be blessed to study the practice of the Jews even today who don't believe Jesus of Nazareth is Messiah, yet they, and, and, and therefore they still practice Sabbath, traditional Sabbath. You may be blessed by this, but remember, I'm going to jump from this. Remember, the idea of Sabbath, the whole idea is a day of rest, a day to reflect a day to enjoy the completed work of God. It's beautiful. Okay? It's, it's, it's this idea, okay, that, that, that caused the earliest Christians to say things like Maranatha. Lord, we want you to come back. And we want you to come quickly. Okay? We have a I found this in a prayer that some of us in this room are very familiar with this week, and I loved it. I never read the prayer this far. It says, we can in Jesus be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with God forever in the next. That may sound familiar to some of you. This is the idea of Sabbath. We're able to have reasonable peace and rest and happiness now, but supreme peace and rest and happiness when he consummates the kingdom. Maranatha. Lord, come, we want that. Man, I'm so confused, guys. I don't know how to live this life and walk like Jesus. Sometimes I think I do, I just don't listen to him. You know, I struggle. There was a song we sang. I don't remember which one it was, Scott, but it said, I think it was, How Long Has It Been Since We Just Gave Him Our Hearts Hidden Secrets. You know? Man, do that. You give your heart those hidden secrets, and you think, God, I just, I don't, I don't know. Um, but I know what would fix it, dear God. Just come. Oh, just come on, you know. Lord, come quickly. Okay? That is so good for Christians. This is such a wonderful faith. I've, I've really tried to express how unique our faith is to people recently. I think sometimes we grow up, and I'm getting a little off script here, but I think sometimes we grow up and we think you're either Christian or you're not. It's either Jehovah God or no God. Look here, Christianity is awesome. And our God, our unique God is awesome. He's different. Jesus is different. Okay? We get to live a Sabbath rest now. Therefore, we uphold the fourth commandment now through Jesus. It's not been nullified. We are kingdom people daily, Christ followers forever, baptized believers with new life in an eternal seventh day. This is so good. We, we are not just 
first day, one day Christians. We're not. This, we, 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 if, if this is how we think, so unfortunate. That jumps us into Luke 14, okay? Luke 14. Not being just one day Christians. One holy day, pious, ritualistic people. But everyday people of rest and peace and Sabbath with a message that transforms the world. That is as cute as I get with slides, so you better enjoy that, okay? You, many of you know me well enough to know that's about as cute as I get. So I've never, I've, I've never and, and this is the reason I did this, you know, you can, I'm, I'm about to lay it on you. I've never, I've never shared this. I've never been able to see that logo for Full House the same since I heard a man say, he's the man that baptized me, he said, Stephen, we could have a full house in our churches. He said, but I think we wouldn't want the people who filled them. You know, you know, when you look back on your life and you realize little things and little memories that stuck out to you, things that for whatever reason you just didn't let go, that's one, guys, that's one. To hear a man of faith suggest that he knew how we could have full houses of worship but that we probably wouldn't want the people who filled them. So, did I ruin Full House for you? Sorry. <laughs> full House. Our God desires for his house to be full. And I mean way more than just this room today. He wants his house full. Walk with me through Luke 14, and perhaps you'll see it too, okay? The religious leaders that Jesus had encountered while journeying to Jerusalem had really let their traditions distract them. I'm going to be really careful and be loving with you in that. A lot of what we do is tradition. This is good for us to understand. Okay, but, but, but Sabbath was a law, too. They had just added traditions to it. Okay, and they had let their traditions distract them from the law, and then they had missed the heart of the law. I don't point fingers when I preach this, because this is us. This is us. We have ways that we need to honor and worship our God. And oftentimes we build traditions that we, are, that, that, that we intend to be good, that uphold those ways, but then we lose the heart of them in our traditions. This is exactly what the Pharisees, the legalists, the lawyers, the scribes had done. And so and this is what Jesus is encountering. They had created a super holy day, if you will, and thus they had become blind to the heart of holiness. Holy day, blind to the heart of holiness. And they had so ignored, they had so much ignored the purpose of the law. They had ignored the whole story of God who is great and who shares himself with, with beings that are less. They had so ignored this. They had so ignored their own prophets that they did not even recognize the Son of God before them. You ever considered that? They claimed to be people of God, yet they didn't recognize him standing right in their midst. Okay. Jesus, hear me now, he couldn't stand it. That's what I see. He couldn't stand it. He could not be silent when his father's image and purpose was being misrepresented. See it with me. This is uh, Luke, Luke 14. Okay. <clears throat> It happened that while he went into the house of one of the leaders of the Pharisees, mind you, he's in this guy's house, and it was Sabbath, to eat bread, they were watching him closely. And there in front of him was a man suffering from, uh, my translation says dropsy, uh, a swelling. Um, some translations may say edema. He had fluid buildup to some extent, I don't know. Jesus answered and spoke to the lawyers and the Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on Sabbath or not? But they kept silent. And he took hold of him, and he healed him, and he sent him away. And he said to them, which one of you will have a son or an ox 
fall into a well and will not immediately pull him out on a Sabbath day. And they could make no reply to this. Don't you love that part? They had, couldn't say anything. I have to think it got pretty awkward in there, you know. I was thinking, so, Eleazar, how was your week, you know? <laughs> There's so much of this that I would like to know more about. We know that Jesus' Sabbath behavior had become an issue. Okay, if you've been following me, studying at all in Luke to this point, you see that he's gotten into some trouble over his Sabbath behavior. I think the first time we see it is in chapter 6, and then we saw it in chapter 13. And each time the Pharisees, the legalists, the lawyers, the scribes, uh, they get upset. Uh, the text will sometimes say they felt humiliated, right? Sometimes the text will say they were enraged, wanted to figure out how to stop him, okay? And so it seems that Jesus' invitation, to me, it seems this invitation may be entrapment, okay? Let's give him an opportunity to do something else wrong. We can keep piling up the charges, okay? Or maybe they think he's just too foolish to do it again, all right? Well, he just called us hypocrites in the synagogue. I bet he won't do that in my house, okay? I'm just suggesting here, I don't know. I, I like to laugh a little bit and think, that maybe the guy who invited him had no clue. <laughs> maybe he had no, he said, come on, Jesus, you'll love this meal with the Pharisees and the leaders, just come on and have a seat with us. And boy, you know, that guy might have felt pretty, pretty awkward. I don't know. But either way, I think it's possible, it's entirely possible that the Nazarene, Jesus, was sticking out like a sore thumb. You know what? This wasn't, I, I, I don't think this was the kind of room that he was, you know, typically in. These weren't the type of sinners and tax collectors that he was most known for eating with. And so you might expect, we know Jesus, we love Jesus. Where was his attention during this very ritualistic, pious celebration feast? Where was his attention? Who's hurting in here? Who's, who's, come, who's, who's fell in here today suffering? Who, who sticks out in this room? That's where Jesus' attention was. Who doesn't have it all put together? You see our Jesus? So the guy's suffering. Dropsy, edema, fluid buildup, I don't know. I assume it was terribly uncomfortable, which sends my mind just running. How was the guy there? Was he invited? Was he? Be I don't know. I don't know. I wish I did. We'll know one day. But the guy was there, and Jesus' attention was on him. And, and, and I love thinking about how Jesus' zeal for God renders him unable to just play Sabbath. You hear me? His zeal for God, his knowledge of God, God's desire to help and to heal and to love, l renders him unable to just go through the motions of that feast. Can't do it. You know? Again, he's about to make it really uncomfortable. And he did. I couldn't wait to share this with you. And so um, keep a finger in Luke 14, but just really, really loving the Psalms. Uh, flip over to Psalm 22, and I want you to see something with me. So we've been, we've been blessed walking through these Psalms. Check out 22. I'm going to read a little more than what's on the screen. 22, starting in verse 22. psalmist writes, I will tell of your name to my brethren. Attention to the word, please. I will tell of your name to my brethren. Oh, you, my help, hasten to my assistance. I have help in none other, oh God, and I will proclaim it to my brethren. Deliver my soul, I'm sorry, uh, you who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, you glorify him, and you stand in awe. There's our word. I love hearing our kids say God is awesome. You stand in awe of him, all you descendants of Israel. Now look at 24. For, notice the conjunction there. Okay? For he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. Nor has he hidden his face from him, 
But when he cried to help, to him for help, he heard. Oh, I love that. Can you hop into that one with me? I'm going to praise God in the midst of people. I'm going to praise him. I'm going to praise him. One, because I know who my help comes from. Okay? And, 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 and that conjunction, therefore, indicates to me that the reason we praise God, why, church, is not just that he alone and by himself is awesome, but the reason we praise our God is because he helps. He shares. I was talking to a friend this week. You know, God, it, have, think about this with me. Let this settle in. It might change everything, perhaps. You know, God would not be supremely good if he sat up there wherever and just kept to himself. You ever thought about that? The reason that God is supremely good is because he's so good and he shares himself. And this is why we praise him. Any of you praising in him, uh, him in here today who don't feel like he saved you? Any of you praising him who don't feel like everything you got is from him? Well, I guarantee you're going through the motions. You know what? It ain't coming from your heart. If you feel like you've just got it figured out, you're good without him, don't need him. Maybe you're here because your mom and dad have made you. Maybe you're here because it's just what you do on Sunday. I don't know. But when God becomes your everything and you realize that all you have is from him and there, therefore everything is through him and then back to him, the, you know, the, Paul said in Romans 11, you see that? We praise him. For he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. You jump back over into Luke 14. You see that? He, he, he couldn't play church if, 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 if you pardon that connection. I shared with you a few weeks how it is okay for us to connect what we do on Sundays with what, with, with, with what they did on Sabbath. I know it's not a perfect connection, but, it, but it's okay to connect these things. Jesus couldn't sit there and play church with the man hurting. Couldn't play Sabbath. Again, I love seeing how the reason we praise God is because he has not ignored, or some text says, belittled the suffering of the needy. And church, I'll, su I'll suggest to us, we cannot please God. You can sing all these songs, every word of every verse, in the right pitch. We cannot please God if we refuse to help the hurting. How could our God have been pleased with a pious Sabbath feast with this everything put together all the bread cooked the right way if help to this man was ignored if healing him was considered inappropriate for God's day of rest they had missed the point we can miss the point too do we think that by claiming to be of Christ by simply being here today our God is pleased if we spend our lives serving ourselves? Do we think that by claiming to be of Christ, being here today, doing things well, that we are pleasing God if we are not purposefully, listen now, purposefully engaging the lost and the hurting? Do we think we're pleasing God? I, I don't say this because I got it. Those of you that are close to me, you know that, man, this is challenging me. I told you two weeks ago I couldn't preach 14. I wasn't ready. I'm still not ready now. Doesn't mean I'm ready today. Again, we cannot please God with our praise while also ignoring the hurting. Are we presenting a life to God? Is, is, is the life, rather, that we're presenting to God acceptable sacrifice to God? If... If, if not, that Maranatha prayer ought to really terrify us. It really ought to. Um, I've tried not to take us far from Luke's gospel in this study. I've tried not to. But I had to, to, I couldn't help but think about Matthew 25. And the danger of Matthew 25 is that this is one that, that we're probably all familiar with. Um, and so that increases the likelihood of us ignoring it. Okay? Uh, turn over to 25. Some of it's on the screen. Again, I'm going to challenge you because we become so familiar with texts and verses, we tend to ignore them. I, I, would, I would suggest, and this, 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 maybe I just need to speak for me here, uh, for me, I would suggest for me, this has been one of the most clear yet ignored passages of all of the New Testament. Matthew 25. 
when the Son of Man, I, I connected this in my, in my thinking because this is, you know, the, the, the cry of Maranatha, you know, Lord, come quickly. Well, when he comes, this is to some extent what it's going to look like, okay? When the Son of Man, verse 31 of Matthew 25, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, and then he will sit on his glorious throne, the Son of Man coming, sitting on his glorious throne, and all the nations will be gathered around him, and he will separate them from one another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, and he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And then the king will say to those on his right, Come. You might have already checked out. It's so familiar. Attention to the word. Come on. Come. You who are blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick. And you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Got another letter from Steve. I didn't read this until just a minute ago. Hey, church, good morning. God has blessed us with another beautiful day. How amazing. You know, before I used to take all this beautifulness for granted, and at the same time it was like it was just black and white. But now, wow, what a difference. Y'all just don't know how great I feel knowing that I have a family again, and that I'm loved, and that, and that y'all have my back. I just can't find the words to express how grateful I truly am. Again, y'all are amazing. They've started a new Bible study, and so I won't have much free time, but that's a good thing. I love studying about Jesus, and I like hearing what other people get out of it. It's great. I'm sorry I haven't got to get back to many of you, but please don't think I'm not thinking of you and praying for all of you, because I am. I love every one of you dearly. I'll try to get back to all of you because I do appreciate the cards and all the love that has come. The canteen is out of stamps till Friday, so I'll send a lot out this weekend. I've had so many compliments about all my cards. They'll say, man, you sure are loved, and I'll say loved by the best. I have all my cards on my door and on my bed. Well, it's time for group, then it's Bible study. I'm excited about that. So I'll finish this letter later. Love you all. I guess he took a pause and then came back. He says, hey, I hope all of you are doing well. I found a quote I would like to share with y'all. He says, be a somebody who makes everybody feel like a somebody. I feel like I was meant to see this and share it with you because that's exactly what y'all did for me. And I can't tell you enough how grateful I am to all of you. I love you all so much, I can't wait to see you. I have a gift for you. I can't decide whether I'll mail it or just bring it back. Well, I'll just go for now. Know that I love you and I miss you dearly. Love, Steve. So I know that uh, I keep talking about Steve a lot. And um, I remind you that our experience with him has been like I don't think anything I've ever experienced. Um, and so here's the thing. I can't help but think, God help me, I can't help but think that some of us may be waiting for it to not work. 
there's a good chance it won't. I mean, work, like, you know, be long-term faithfulness, look like dressing nice and coming to church and life figured out. I don't know. But here's what I do think. I think he is under the impression that what he received may be normal behavior from Christians. And I challenge you to consider with me whether or not it really is. It's not about whether he accepts or rejects, walks or doesn't. It's about us doing what we see in Matthew 25 from our Savior Jesus. Amen? It's about us doing it. I would suggest to us that it matters not how we do this today. It does matter how we do this today, but we're missing the point. It matters not how we do this today if we are ignoring the hurting. Okay? I'm guilty of, of preaching this probably a lot and not doing it. That's, that's where the challenge has gotten so real for me. I'm agonizing over this challenge and what it, what it looks like for my life. I've invited you to agonize and squirm with me in this journey. I'm guilty of, of preaching it and not, not telling us how this can be done. And what I mean by that is not telling us like step by step what this looks like. I don't know. I don't know how to tell us to step by step, you know, engage the hurting every day. I, I don't know. I, I, I kind of think it means just, just having a life that is open to it and, and then God trusting that God will bless us with the opportunities, okay? But here's something that I think that I've left out. And this might really change everything, okay? So I get excited, and I won't get through the rest of the lesson, but i gotta sh- I got to share you this, okay? This could change it all. And so sometimes I wonder, Stephen, why don't I care? Confession, why don't I care? Like, uh, what, what is it about me? What, what, what's the switch that needs to flip to help me care, okay? And I'm going to suggest, I don't think I've ever really said this, but, but, but I think this is it. I'm going to suggest that, that we won't care if we're prideful people. You think, well, that's nothing new. We hear that all the time, right? We won't care if we think that we're good. We won't care if we think that we're better than Steve or name. We, we won't care if we think we're better than the person on the bench or, or the person who doesn't have the means to, to afford food. We won't care if we think we're better than the person who's lost their job or who refuses to work. We, we won't care if we think we're better. And the message of God, hear me, the message of God that motivates our care is that we are nothing without God. Nothing. There, there is not a thing that you have today that, 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 that you can have apart from God. Nothing. Now, 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 this really gets in the face of us, and I know it does. And so I calm down. It gets in my face, too. There is this mentality that I think is promoted and encouraged and even lived by Christians that is one of a, we have what we've earned. We, we, we have what we've worked hard for. I may, I may start calling it the bootstrap mentality. You know what? That we've, we've done it. And so if they, they just haven't. Church, that's, that's not of God. The, the very breath that we breathe is of God. You know? The, the, the muscles of our, that we have are of God. What, what is, um, okay, so um, Psalm 16, Psalm 16, these Psalms, they're, they're, they're life-changing if you'll let them. Psalm 16, preserve me, O God, for I take refuge in you. Do you see this reliance on God? I said to the Lord, you are my Lord, I have no good besides you. Do you see this? How can we be people of God and think that anything that we have, we could have apart from him? It's, 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 it's a message of humility, and this is why. I, I, I love it. it the, 
the, the, the Bible becomes so cool and it just opens up to you when you see what Jesus does. Look in 14. Just go back to 14 and now look what Jesus is doing. Right? He, is, he has done this, this, this thing in the middle of Sabbath feast where he has given attention to the herding. Okay? And then he gives us three parables. Every parable is about the same thing. Humble yourselves to be exalted. Humble yourselves to be exalted. You, you will not see like Jesus. You will not be characteristic of God Almighty with pride. Our God from creation in his supremacy again said, I am sharing myself and I am exalting humankind who are lesser than me to be like me in my image. Do you see this? This is the story of God. For us to be people who refuse to share or who think we have anything apart from God is the exact definition of rebellion. It's the very sin of the garden. We can do it without you, God. This is what Jesus does. Again, his plan from creation has been to take something slightly lower than himself and exalt it. We reject God's plan from creation by refusing to share with others. Jesus illustrated this in parables. I got two minutes. So I won't do it. I'll read it. Attention to the word. He began speaking a parable to the invited guest. This is after that silence. He began speaking a parable to the invited guest. When he noticed how they had been picking out places of honor at the table. You see this? He said, when you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor. For someone more distinguished than you may have been invited by them. And he who invited you both will come to you and say, give your place to this man. And then in disgrace you will proceed to occupy the last place. But when you are invited, go and, rec and recline at the last place, so that when the one who has invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher, and then you will have honor in the sight of all who are at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who, exalts, uh, he who humbles himself will be exalted. I've lived this parable. I tell a funny, quick one on me. I came to a rehearsal dinner one time for a friend, not knowing that I was in the wedding party. And so I sat down in the pew, and all the groomsmen started taking their spots, and one was left open. And the groom said, Stephen, get up here. And I go, oh, am I in the wedding? <laughs> he said, of course you're in the wedding. Get up here. <laughs> How weird it would have been if, if, if that were reversed. If I had just shown up to the rehearsal, took a spot, and for him to say, Stephen, sorry, sit. <laughs> I couldn't help but think, this, this, this hurts me bad, but I can't help but think there may be some of us who think we have a position in the place of the bride of Jesus. Only for Jesus to look at us and say, I don't know you. What if, what if uh, on, a, on my wedding day, if, if those doors had opened, not here, and it were not Kelly, would I have gone through with that wedding? No, Kelly, I would not have. <laughs> Who are you, right? Do you, you see the connection here? How tragic for us to think that by doing stuff, we have a place as the bride of Christ only for him to say, I don't know you. Might, might cause a, a bride to, to weep and gnash teeth, right? It's the language of Scripture. Jesus would go on to say, when you have, this is verse 12, when you have a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors. Otherwise, they may also invite you in return that you will have your repayment. Well, Jesus, that doesn't sound all that bad, right? 
And remember, these are parables. These are for specific messages. Jesus would say, but when you have a reception, invite the poor and the crippled and the lame and the blind, and you will be blessed since they do not have the means to repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. This is exactly what Jesus means when he says, lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. How many of us live this life and we give and we serve only with this expectation that we had better receive something back in this life? This, this, is an exact, this, this is exact proof that we don't value the kingdom of heaven when we only serve with expectation to receive in this life. Jesus says, don't do that. Lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. Invite those who, who can't pay you back for the very purpose of them knowing the Father. You'll receive your reward in the resurrection. I love this verse. Fifteen will make you mad if you let it. It needs to. So, so Jesus is telling us that our attention, our focus needs to be on the crippled and the hurting and the poor and the sick and those who need hope. And what does this man in 15 say? When one who was reclining at the table with him heard this, he said, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Was he wrong? No, he's not wrong. Yes, blessed is everyone who eats at the kingdom of God. But what is Jesus trying to help us focus on, church? The ones who are hurting. Not the 99, the one who has left. Right? He'll, he'll go on to teach parables of lost sheep and lost coins and prodigals. This needs to, 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 to cause us to cringe. Sometimes we want to ignore something very specific and hide behind an excuse. Jesus says, open your eyes. Stephen, I don't know if that's right. Well, just read it with me and we'll close. Again, he didn't say, right, brother, amen. Amen. He said, a man was giving a big dinner, and he invited many. And at the dinner hour, he sent his slave to say to those who had, who had been invited, Come, for everything is ready now. But they all alike began to make excuses. And the first one said to him, I have bought a piece of land, and I need to go out and look at it. Please consider me excused. Another one said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I am going to try them out. Please consider me excused. Another said, I have married a wife. For that reason, I cannot come. He didn't ask to be excused. He said, I've married a wife. Of course, I don't have to come. And the slave came back and reported this to his master. And then the head of the household became angry. And by the way, Luke is pretty calm in this account. You flip over to Matthew 22, Matthew let it rip. Luke says pretty calm. The household, um, the head of the household became angry and said to his slave, Go out at once into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. You see what Jesus has done there? Open your eyes. Yes, everyone who sits at the table of God is blessed, but I am telling you specifically, open your eyes. By the way, this is neat. The, the idea here is that Jesus says, start with the city. Start there. Okay? Look what happens. The slave said, Master, uh, we've done what you've commanded, and still there's room. And so the master then says to the slave, well, then go out to the highways and to the hedges, and you compel them to come in so that my house may be filled. You see this? This is neat. Start and just go out. Compel them. Full house. Bring them. 24, for I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my dinner. The lesson on Sabbath and dinner invitations, right? But I can't help for us to consider in closing. Would Jesus come to our Sabbath feast? Would this Jesus be present among our assembly today? Would he, would he say, those are my people? That's who I'm going to go and praise my God, my Father, with. 
Would you do that? That might seem too hypothetical. And so I just ask you to consider something that is very biblical, right? When we stand before him, this Jesus who we claim to, follow, to know and follow and love, when we stand before him, will he say, welcome, because you saw them, you know, you saw them, you tried, you saw them, you helped, you saw them, or will he say, depart, I don't, I don't know you, you didn't see them, you didn't see me. You can get mad at this, this is what happened in the text. Um, the Pharisees, the legalists, they'd get really mad. They'd say, get him out of here. We don't like that kind of stuff. You can get mad and you can ignore it, just not care. Or you can get excited that this is our king. This is our teacher, the one who brings hope to all people. You can get excited about that. You know what? You won't get excited if you don't know his healing. But you humble yourself. You get excited about this. And you see people who are lowly and you say, I got this message of exaltation. Come and see, right? It's good. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. John Austin, you read this really neat account. Really cool. You keep reading. I asked you to read that verse 18 because you keep reading, and the people were scared to death to hear the words of God. They were scared. They said, Moses, please, you stand in between that God and us because if he talks directly to us, we're dead. So it is with Jesus. We have this way, this message that allows us to stand in the presence of Almighty God through Jesus. To stand, even the most lowly among us to stand. Ring it out. Amen? Ring it out. You want to respond to it today? I'd love to receive you. The invitation is yours. Let's sing.